Welcome to Torchlight's Exceptional Parenting Podcast, where we talk with the nation's top experts about today's toughest parenting challenges. Whether you're concerned about your child's development, learning, behavior, or you just want to make family time more enjoyable, we share the practical solutions and tools that can help. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of Torchlight's Exceptional Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Stephanie Boucher, and today I'm here with serial entrepreneur and substance abuse expert, Carolyn Bradfield. Carolyn is the co-founder of Phoenix Outdoor, a licensed wilderness therapy program that focuses on substance abuse, addiction, and intense family treatment. Recently, we had Carolyn on the show to talk about what parents can do to prevent their children from abusing drugs and alcohol and developing the disease of addiction. Today, by contrast, we'll be talking about what to do if your child has already developed a substance abuse disorder. Just a quick reminder that if you don't have access to a Torchlight Child account, as offered in your employer's benefits plan, but you'd like to, you can have your employer call us. They can find our information on our website, which is torchlight.care. That's www.tor. C-H-L-I-G-H-T dot C-A-R-E. So without further ado, let's get started. Welcome, Carolyn. Thank you so much for being here with me again today. I appreciate the opportunity, Stephanie, and um, it's great to be part of your initiative. Well, you know, for those of you who uh, haven't heard my prior conversation with Carolyn, uh, I spoke with her recently um, about her experiences uh, helping her daughter through her 15-year-long uh, battle with addiction, which um, quite sadly ended uh, just recently this last December um, due to overdose. And I spoke with Carolyn at great length about the topic of drug and alcohol prevention, uh, which is just such an incredibly important topic uh, in the midst of this terrible epidemic that we are going through as a nation right now. Um, but I wanted to bring you back to talk about the other side of this problem, which is what to do if you believe your child has already developed a problem with substance abuse or addiction and how to handle that. Because while one of your main goals since the passing of your daughter is to help other families prevent this from happening, there are so many families out there that are already finding themselves in the midst of this crisis. And um, you're really a wealth of knowledge there for us because you have seen this issue from so many different sides. And I, I'd really love to get your perspective on what to do uh, if your family is in the midst of a crisis. So let's start with something uh, which is, you know, at the most basic level of this issue, which is having the ability to recognize when there is a problem. Um, we do our best to try to prevent our kids from coming into harm's way. But what should parents be on the lookout for? What are the red flags? Well, giving you a little bit more about my background, um, as you know, um, from our prior conversation, my daughter's substance use began when she was 14 years old. And I was definitely the last person to know. And mm -hmm. then um, in 2004, I created a licensed wilderness therapy program in North Carolina to treat substance abuse and addiction in ages 13 to 17. And what I found interesting in the several hundred families that we worked with, almost all of them, you know, thought the problem um looked one way. And then when we started digging in, it was probably 90% worse than they thought it was. So really? uh, understanding what those um, early signals are that are um, your child is in trouble is pretty important. And what I will tell you is oftentimes the parents are really the last ones to know because um, things may not all of a sudden cascade and, and, you know, go downhill as quickly as you might think. There's definitely um, some early warning signs um, that you shouldn't just write off to teenage behavior because, you know, teenagers, they, you know, their hormones are going crazy. And so oftentimes you'll say, oh, that's just because they're a teenager. Yeah. So, so here's, here's a couple of things that you ought to be looking at, even though you may not see the signs of substance abuse that you've got a developing problem. 
Uh, thing number one is that their mood is abnormally higher or lower roller coastering than you would normally expect to see in a teenager. So if the kid is euphoric, if they're seriously depressed, and then all of a sudden they swing back and forth between those two states of being without really a trigger doing that, that tells you that, you know, you may have a problem that they're, that they could be acting out or abusing drugs, which is, uh, could be contributing to those behaviors. The other thing that you might want to really look at is if the child has been, teenagers have been normally uh, friendly, outgoing, and active, and all of a sudden they, they withdraw. You know, they may be depressed, they may feel rejected by their friends. Um, they may have social anxiety, but if they enjoy being around you and they enjoy the things that the family did and all of a sudden they stop doing that, then that's another sign that something has dramatically changed. So you need to be on the lookout. Big thing is they start to keep secrets. <laughs> so oh, yeah. uh, all of a sudden, you know, uh, you want to go into their backpack and you want to put their lunch in there and they slip out on you that, or you can't, you, you no longer have access to their room or they're starting to hide things. They're engaging in a pattern of secrecy that that's a tip off. A really big one is you got a good kid, a good student and their grades start to, to cascade downward. Um, in my daughter's case, she was a solid, solid D student. She didn't knock it out of the park, but you could always depend on that solid A or B. And then all of a sudden, the grades uh, go to C's, D's, and F's. Why is that? What's changed? Well, generally, it's changed because, you know, their behaviors change and oftentimes drugs are involved. Another huge thing in my daughter's case is that she changed her sport when she went to high school. She was a soccer player before. Then she became a rower. So that connected group of girls that were her friends that we all knew were no longer there. So she had a completely different group of friends. Um, they, she wasn't bringing those friends around. So when the friend group changes, that's also a, a big sign particularly in girls, if their weight starts to really change. In Laura's case, um, a, a sure sign that she was using drugs is her weight dropped dramatically. And she felt very proud of that. I look at me, I'm so skinny. Oh, okay. that, was, that was because she was using methamphetamine. Well, so yeah, everybody can get skinny doing that or using heroin. So if you start to see the weight fluctuating weight up or down, that's a big change. If all of a sudden um, they start to dress way differently. And in her case, it was, you know, t-shirts that um, had pot stuff on it or drug drug stuff or skulls or whatever. That may be fashionable. However, it also may be sending you a message. So pay attention when their, their dress changes. And then, you know, a big one is if they start engaging in risk-oriented behavior that they never did before, um, they skip school, they sneak out, they start vandalizing things. Those are a sign that the teenager is throwing caution to the wind, and that may also indicate that they're absolutely willing and are starting to experiment because what the heck, you know, they're just going to start taking the risk. So those are some things that parents need to, to, to be careful about. Grades change, friends change, the way they dress changes, weight changes, mood changes, social activity changes. Those are all clear warning signals that you're, that you've likely got a problem. Sure. Now, some of those things that you mentioned um, also happen to be things that might be sort of stereotypical teenage behavior. Teenagers will often become a little bit more secretive with their parents. They are seeking uh, more individuality at that time. They are separating from the family just a bit. And some of this could be developmentally appropriate. Where would a parent be able to recognize the difference between what's developmentally appropriate separation from the family versus having it go to a level that is signaling something deeper? Well, I think it's when it, it becomes extreme. When I said mood swings, yeah, they're going to have mood swings. They're going to sash you, do the things that teenagers do. But, but wild mood swings when there's no trigger or reason for it. 
Um, I, I don't think dropping grades, a dramatic drop in grades is ever developmentally appropriate. So there's a new okay. trigger that's happened there that you had a solid kid for years and years in school and all of a sudden their grades are, you know, off the chain. That That's an absolute trigger. If their friends change, you need to get to know who their friends are. In, in Laura's case, um, I knew all of her friends very well. I knew their parents. And then all of a sudden, I knew none of them. The, the old crowd never came around. So if they're unwilling to bring the new friends into your house and connect with you, that's a major red flag to me because they don't want you to know. Not because, not because you know, it's part of their development. is because there's something wrong <laughs> with the friend. Absolutely. Base. And then I think, you know, when kids start to break the law, you know, vandalizing things is breaking the law. Sneaking out and taking your car at night, which is what Laura did, is breaking the law. So when you can't contain them and they're starting to do things that they know are absolutely wrong, that's that's a huge signal. So it's the extremes that you're looking for. Great. So if a parent notices these red flags and they, they see these signs of trouble, what should a parent do first? Well, I think you ought to start investigating. So you've got bad grades. Go up to the school, talk to the teachers, talk to the counselor and find out what their perspective is. You know, so in Laura's case, when that started happening, um, I went up to the school and what I found that I was unaware of is that she was skipping class. So she would check in at home room, meaning that she was present at school And then she wouldn't be in her third period class. So they were wondering about, okay, where is she? She's been absent from school a lot when you know that's not the case. Or they're they're falling asleep in class or they're not paying attention in class or they're um, not turning in things. In her case, it was because uh, she was buying vodka, putting it in the water bottle that she took to school and drinking all day long. You know, so get a signal from your teacher about what they think is going on. And then ask, you know, what kind of crowd she's hanging out with. If they see her hanging out with a rough crowd, they're going to tell you that. Um, another way to investigate is to solicit feedback from your neighbors and friends that know them. Um, that's actually how I found out Laura was using the kids in the neighborhood were telling their parents about what Laura was doing. And then the girls that I knew, uh, the ladies, my friends got together with me and said, hey, I don't know exactly what's going on, but this is what my, my kids are telling me about Laura. That was an early warning signal. So start investigating and don't be reluctant to go into their room, into their phone, it, you know, check out their computer. Or, you know, I mentioned in our prior conversation the importance of monitoring electronics. Start monitoring those things so that you can see patterns. You know, what's different? What are they talking about? What are they looking at? Are they looking up drugs? When I looked at Laura's uh, search history, I found all kinds of information that she was looking up. How to make methamphetamine? What about heroin? Mm -hmm. Those are things that they don't need to be looking up. So start that investigation process. And then, you know, a really easy thing to do is to give them a drug test. If you have not been proactively testing your child for drugs, which I highly recommend that you do very early, much earlier than you would do, maybe think perhaps in the eighth grade, um, and you've never done that, then go to Walgreens, CVS, your local drugstore, get a uh, five panel urine test and test them and do it randomly where they don't see it coming because sometimes you can alter the test. And if you don't feel that's definitive enough, go pull out a few strands of their hair and do a hair test. They cost more, about 60 bucks for the hair test, about you know 2 or $3 for the, the urine test, but go get a definitive look and see what you're really dealing with. Um, drugs stay in your system a long time. So if you've been smoking pot on a regular basis, that'll stay in your system 48 days. If you've been using other drugs, that will stay in your system in a urine test for up to a week, but it stays in your hair forever. So you really want to know, pull out those hair follicles because any substance you've ingested will stay in the hair strand and in the hair follicle and it'll stay there forever. So you can get a really definitive test on that. Sure. Now that's interesting. Uh, I did not realize that drug tests were available at your local pharmacy. Uh, that is, in fact, the case. Absolutely, you can order it on, on Amazon. You know, um, for example, um, Amazon sells a product called Easy at Home. Um, it's a five-panel drug test. Uh, you get five of them for ten bucks. 
They'll ship it straight to your house. That's two dollars a test. If you want a hair test, you know, you can get that on Amazon. It's sixty-five dollars, and they'll ship it right to your house. So you can get them anywhere. They're really easy, and you um, have them give you a sample again when they're not expecting it. You dip the stick in. It's easy to read, and you know, you either have they're in the presence of substances or not. And the hair test would be kind of a baseline. You want to get a really good baseline if they've ever done it. Um, the hair test will tell you. Yeah. Now, in our last conversation, you had mentioned a father who was very upfront with his teenager and saying that he would, uh, at random, administer drug tests on a regular basis. Is that something that you would recommend um, putting out there to a child if you already suspect they have an issue with substance abuse? Would you kind of make the statement that says, I, I will test you regularly at random? Or are you really looking for or this is a situation that's already progressed? and you're, you don't want them to have advanced warning, yeah, just, so, just so our listeners are, are clear on the right yeah. steps to take. Okay, so there's two, there's two positions on drug testing. Position number one is that you're going to do it as a benefit to your child and a preventative strategy so that when he or she is asked to use drugs, you can shift blame to mom and dad who proactively drug test you all the time and you'll never get away with it, Right. Um, you could actually use that same strategy with your child that's using and say, hey, listen, um, I know that substance use in high school is very prevalent. Um, as a result, I'm going to help you out by starting to randomly drug test you so that when you're tempted to use drugs, um, you have an easy excuse to say no because your parents are drug testing you. So let's go right now. <laughs> so you don't mm-hmm. tell them ahead of time. You have the drug test in your hand. You tell them that. You go have them take the sample. And if they're extraordinarily um, opposed and resistant to doing it, then um, that happened to me with Laura one time. I took the scissors and cut off some of her hair and sent it in. You know, So either way, you've got to test them. And maybe you start with, hey, we're going to do this as a help to you and a preventative strategy and not say, hey, listen, I think you've been using. Um, let me go test you. Yeah. Try it that way first, and then if they're uncooperative, just say, hey, listen, this is not optional, and we can either make it easy or hard, pick one. Okay. So say the drug test comes back uh, with the result that no parent wants to see or hear. What should one do next? Well, you know, my, my immediate reaction would be to have a discussion with the child and see how open or not open they are to explaining what's going on. And then immediately I would find a counselor, a third party that can better assess what really is happening. Because as I said before, oftentimes what they're doing is just the tip of an iceberg. So there's a lot more going on behind the scenes than the parents are going to know or will ever know. And often in the confines of a safe place to talk about it with a therapist, you'll get a lot more information about really the size and scope of the problem. So, you know, talk to your kid, but also put them in counseling. And that's that's your way of really kind of scoping what the nature of the problem really is. How big is it? Okay. You note in your work that a substance abuse crisis, if, if a parent finds themselves in the midst of one, is nearly impossible to get through alone. Could you expand on that for us and give parents some recommendations on what they need to do? to get through it? Well, um, you know, I think it takes a village to raise a child. Um, and certainly when it comes to somebody um, that's still a child, perhaps it's your teenager and they're abusing drugs, you've got to enlist the cooperation of a lot of people around you. So, for example, it would be critical for the school to know. It would be critical for your other family members to know. It would be critical for your friends and neighbors to know. And that is a very difficult thing for parents to do because there's a lot of shame and um, embarrassment that you're struggling with this problem. So my encouragement to parents is to start with finding the right words to explain it to others 
what is the problem and what kind of help are you looking for from them? And the easy way to explain the problem is my child is now struggling with a substance abuse problem that I think has developed into the disease of addiction. And because this is a disease, their ability to control their behavior and to stay away from the substance is really, really compromised. I'm attempting to create a strategy to help my child, and I need to enlist your help and support in in this journey with me. Will you help me? And then tell them exactly what you need. It may be that you need the school to be more communicative with you. It may be that you need your friends and neighbors to be on the lookout and help you monitor and watch. Um, If they also have children, it would be important for them to know that your child is using, you know, so therefore it's like having the flu, (laughs) you know, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to infect others, which is often the case. And certainly your family members need to be aware of it so that when that child starts to do things behaviorally to go feed their addiction, i.e. steal money, lie, take things, etc., they're steeled from that because they know what the facts are. You know, so you don't want the child going to grandma to go get money that they're just going to turn around and go buy heroin with. So everybody in the community of their circle needs to know what the problem is, that you're crafting a strategy to deal with it, but you need their cooperation. Yeah, I I absolutely love that you're making that point. Um, I think, as you touched on, the inclination for many people is to do the opposite and to keep it a secret. As you mentioned, there is so much shame. And I think it's very, very important that we do everything we can to just take the shame and take that right out of it. Um, This is, as we mentioned, a problem that can happen to any person in any family, anywhere in America. And there, there is no shame there. And also other people don't always know what to do and how to help you and they're afraid to do anything. So it's very, very important, as you say, to let them know how they can help you through this process so that they feel empowered to make decisions that ultimately improve things for your child and your family. Yeah. And also, I think that parents need to reflect on their judgment of other parents. You know, so you need to avoid the temptation of like, oh, God, that would never happen to me or my kid would never do that or I'm such an involved parent that Mm -hmm. certainly my parenting skills are so wonderful that would never happen. And certainly in my daughter's case, um, there were a few people in my circle. That's how they reacted. And I don't blame them for it. I was not educated in order to to appropriately share, you know, what was going on. I didn't have the words or the the background to do it. But we've got to let go of, you know, we're raising that perfect golden child, therefore it can't touch our child, and really empathize with the struggle that the other person is going through. They're not a bad parent. Um, Maybe they've made parenting mistakes, as we all do. We all have. Right. But that child's got a disease. And, you know, you certainly wouldn't judge the parent for being a bad parent if they develop childhood leukemia or diabetes. It's the same thing. It's a disease and they need help treating the disease so that that child can recover. Absolutely. I thank you so much for bringing that up. It's just so incredibly important. So when is it time to seek a deeper level of treatment. Let's cover a couple of things. What are the different treatment options that people have? And uh, when is it time to really take action at a deeper level? I'm going to actually reverse the order of that. Let's talk about when's it time to, to take action. I knew absolutely in my daughter's case that I lost the ability to influence her to keep her safe, to exert any kind of control over her behavior. So the act of seeking the substances was having increasingly negative and dangerous consequences to her. So that's when you know if you've tried local therapy, you've tried changing your family dynamics, perhaps even changing their school, and none of those things are working, you've got to go do something else, right? So now that I've answered that question, let's talk about what options are available to you. Treating addiction is not inexpensive. 
And fortunately, um, insurance companies are now coming back to the point of view that probably a little cheaper to pay for treatment than to pay for the resulting medical consequences if it's left untreated. So first and foremost, families need to examine their insurance situation and look at what treatment is available financially to them through their insurance carrier. And if they don't have that kind of coverage, then they've got a whole different set of decisions that they have to make. In Laura's case and in plenty of other cases, what you really need to do is to focus on how to reset them with a primary intervention program. That could take the form of an inpatient program um, where they go off for 30 days. They get an education on addiction. They get some initial counseling and they get their body gets to reset itself and withdraw from these substances. Oftentimes that needs to happen medically. So, you know, if you've got a kid that's been using a lot of substances, particularly alcohol is incredibly dangerous. You want to um, have a detoxification strategy, and that is always done under medical supervision and almost always in an inpatient setting to make sure that they're safe. In the world of adolescence, you also have the additional opportunities if you want to take it to use an outdoor behavioral therapy program like the one that I ran, a wilderness therapy program. Um, those programs get incredibly strong, good results because there's no possibility that that child will use substances during their treatment because they're off hiking and camping in the National Forest. So you can't get drugs in and out, which sometimes happens in normal programs. And the outdoor milieu of that treatment has a powerful impact on that child when they have to uh, feed themselves. They have to hike from A to B. They have to collaborate and cooperate with a group. And they do it under the supervision of field instructors and therapists. So that's also an option. So I think that you look at what you can afford. You look at what your insurance company will pay for. But finding some kind of primary care program to reset the child is critically important. But know that that is only step one. Step two is what is your aftercare plan? Because addiction doesn't correct itself in 30 days, even though your child looks way better. You know, so what do you do afterwards? If they come home, connecting them to a sober community through AA and NA meetings, through intensive outpatient programs and through other connections is critically important and resetting how your family functions um, is also critically important. You know, so the behaviors, the environment, the friends, the school, all those things that triggered your child to use, they're all going to be present when that child comes home. So you absolutely need to develop an aftercare plan in combination with a therapist or a treatment program so you've got a pathway to success. And sometimes coming home is not the best option. In Laura's case, she didn't come home for two years because she was just that dangerous. So I sent her to a therapeutic boarding school, which bought her another two years of not using. I don't regret that decision. I would do it all day long because I'm pretty sure that had she come home, we would have been right back at it, and she may not have lived to her 18th birthday. Wow. Are there treatment options in every price range? I know you said that it's it's terribly expensive. This is something that unfortunately is true. Uh, what might someone do if they just don't have the funds for one of these more expensive programs? Yeah, I mean, there are definitely options in, in all price ranges. And certainly uh, when Laura's father was treated for alcoholism way too late in his life, he went to a program in Georgia that was $600 a month. Now, you're not going to get the fancy therapeutic intervention and perhaps not the coexisting disorder treatment. But, you know, the good news about having the Internet the good news about having a therapist to talk to opens up the options that are available to you in your in your state. Also, one other thing that parents need to understand is if you're in a public school system and that public school system, which you pay taxes to, to go to those schools, cannot adequately provide a safe education for your child, 
Oftentimes in many states, you can petition the school system to pay for that therapeutic boarding school or these other programs because they can't provide a safe enough environment for your kid. It's not easy, but in our wilderness treatment program, we had a number of people that 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 was paid for by their school system, you know, and the treatment beyond because they could not provide a safe environment for that child to get an education. And that's really an important point that you're making because that is an avenue that so few parents are aware of. Uh, so that, it's great that you're you're bringing that up. Could an educational consultant help get you through that process? An educational consultant can get you through that process. And I used an educational consultant to educate me on um, the options available, and they selected the program that Laura went to, both the wilderness and the aftercare program, just be aware that educational consultants come with a fee. So I'm not sure what it would be today, but back, you know, 15 years ago when Laura entered treatment, um, I believe it was around $3,000 to get their help and advice. Now, one thing that they do for you is they, they tour the country They evaluate programs all over the country, and they know what the range of options are out there. Uh, Oftentimes, programs will look really good on the Internet, but they won't look really good, you know, when you actually get there. So you pay for that expertise in picking the right program. But again, those options are generally reserved for people that have the funds to pay for it. Sure. How could a parent get through that process if they could not afford to hire an educational consultant? Are there things like steps they can take on their own to push that through? Um, yes. I mean, there, are, you know, again, the internet is your friend. You can go to, you can go do internet research. Or you can go look for people's reviews of these programs. There's an association called the National Association of Therapeutic Schools and Programs, NATSAP. Look at their website and they list all the programs that are out there that are in their association so you can get quick access to hundreds of them and take a look at at them. I mean, I would just do Internet research, but then also do your due diligence. Talk to the program in detail. Ask all the right questions. Look on Yelp and other places or or people that have reviewed these programs and make sure that you're picking one that's reputable. Um, As an example, Acadia Healthcare, which is headquartered, I believe, in Nashville, Tennessee, is the largest addiction treatment provider in the country with 247 programs, a number of which work with young adults. They are accredited, JACO accredited, CARF accredited, meaning that they've had governmental oversight in the way that their program functions, um, meaning that they, they're they licensed, they're regulated, and certainly when you go pick a program, you should have certain of those filters. They need to be licensed. They need to be mm-hmm. regulated. You need to be able to check out the reviews. You need to be able to visit if you want to do that. And you need to be able to you know talk to a counselor and ask all the questions that make you comfortable. Yes, absolutely. Uh, back to your prior point about getting help through the public school system in your area. Um, I'll just note really quick that uh, for those of you listening who do have a Torchlight account as offered through your employer, we do have a wealth of information uh, on the Torchlight platform about how to get help from your public school system uh, when your child needs extra support. And I will go into that more at the end of, of this show today. Um, What do you do as a parent if your child cannot successfully maintain their sobriety? Uh, You know, some of these programs that you're discussing can be quite successful. And we certainly wish that for for any family who may be listening uh, in on this conversation. However, sometimes children continue to struggle. What does a parent do in that situation? Well, relapse is a part of recovery. And so if you look at statistically, you know, who is going to relapse, it's a pretty high number. So you're not going to get a perfect child coming out of treatment and they'll never use again. Um, Laura went through, you know, long periods of sobriety. Uh, from the age of 18 to 21, she wasn't using and then she relapsed. And so, you know, you know that relapse is a part of recovery. I think that you've got to have a really good home contract and plan so that, the child understands what triggers them to use, 
Um, how do they know when they've been triggered? Who will they allow to help them? And certainly it needs to be mom and dad. And what will they allow you to do so that there is an understanding up front between child and parent about, you know, what's the plan and process when they've been triggered and they relapse and, and what do you do? Um, and I think that's individualized for every parent and every child and in every situation. But I think it does start with a home contract between parent and child that's detailed so that we, you know, we're all clear with our expectations. And, you know, understand that you may have to repeat the treatment process, as I did with Laura. Um, she didn't go to just one primary care intervention. She went to multiples. And it's, again, when that behavior became dangerous enough where it could not be managed at home, it could not be controlled, she didn't have control of it, and the behaviors that she was engaging in were threatening her life. And so you, you need to understand that you might have to go back and repeat the therapeutic process or extend the process. You know, um, maybe you didn't have a long enough aftercare plan. Uh, maybe the child should not have come home. So you have to go look at what didn't work in your plan and, and alter it so that you get a different outcome. Yeah. And you write in the uh, Laura Project about um, knowing your triggers or you, you, you cite two triggers in particular as being the real biggies, stress and boredom, but that each individual can also have their own triggers um, that can lead to you know a relapse. What can someone do to identify their triggers so that they can sort of get a, get a leg up on that situation? I mean, I think it's working with a counselor to really yeah. focus in on that. You know, when you've used in the past, what led up to it? Um, where were you? Who were you with? What was the, what was the draw? Because they're going to know what those things are. Yeah, man, you know, I, I, I'm with these group of friends and this is what happens and I'm here or I hear these songs. You know, so once they start to talk it out, they'll start to list it out and they'll identify what their triggers are. You know, in Laura's case, it, it was lots of things. It was the friend group, the location, where she lived. You know, she lived with me for the last three years of her life, and that was a trigger. And we knew that going in that, you know, being at home was more of a depressive for her than anything else. Um, so knowing what those things are is all really a matter of just talking it out, thinking it out, and just looking at what your patterns have been historically. Great advice. As you know, going through this process, which in some cases can extend for quite a long time, causes the parents and other family members a tremendous amount of stress and uh, harm. What can a parent or family member be doing uh, throughout this journey to care for themselves, because that's incredibly important as well. You have to be in a good space yourself in order to take care of someone else in this way. Right. So when we ran our therapeutic program for adolescents, Phoenix Outdoor, we worked as hard, if not harder, in helping the family as we did with the child. So in an average week while the child was in wilderness therapy, our parents were um, going to a virtual online support group with each other. They We provided them their own counselor to work through their situation. They met with the kid's counselor. We did psychoeducational classes via webinar, and we asked them to go to Al-Anon. So my advice to parents is a couple of things. One, again, enlist the support of your friends so you're not doing it alone, so that you have an understanding group of people around you. That certainly has been the case with the death of my daughter. I have people that check in with me on a regular basis. The second thing is get your own therapist so you can process how you're feeling you know, that shame, that guilt, that remorse, that regret, the trauma, which you, you know, your child goes missing. That's a traumatizing event. And definitely, definitely, definitely go to Al-Anon because now you're in a community of people that are going through the same thing. They're examining the behaviors that they have. Um, as they've reacted to their addicted loved one and they're creating strategies to modify their own behavior so they're not um, engaged in counterproductive and enabling behavior 
And they're also, you know, in a safe community of people that are talking about how they feel about these things. So parents need to care for themselves as much as they're going to care for the child, because if that child comes right back into a family that's dynamically broken with parents that aren't emotionally healthy, um, that is a an accident waiting to happen in terms of the relapse and recovery of their child. Yes, absolutely. Carolyn, thank you so much for sharing all of this with us today. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you allowing us all to get to know you and to get to know Laura through the Laura Project. For those of you listening who don't know about the Laura Project, I encourage you to follow Carolyn on LinkedIn. You can read her writing there. Is there anywhere else they sh- people should be looking for you? I know you're doing a lot these days in terms of, of this initiative. Uh, where can people find you and your work? Well, pretty soon we're going to be launching an educational and informational portal And it'll be found on the URL, Rethink the Family. And in that portal, we'll be putting this content that I've developed up, but we're also soliciting content from others that have a point of view about specifically the prevention and detection of addiction in children. So I'm really focused on early prevention and detection. And then also, you know, some of the subjects that we're talking about now, what do you do when the kid is in trouble? How do you manage through that? So we'll be adding resources with that. I'll be announcing that on LinkedIn, Facebook, et cetera. And perhaps in your Torchlight um, platform, you can put a link over to it so they have additional resources to go look at. Fantastic. Carolyn, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate your time from the bottom of my heart, and I wish you the very best with the Laura Project going forward. Thank you again. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thanks again for listening. If you'd like more information about today's topic and you have a Torchlight Child account, you can log in and explore the substance abuse category found within the eGuides tab on your navigation bar. There, you will find a host of resources on the topic of substance abuse disorders, including information about intervention and how to get your child the help he or she needs to begin the recovery process. If you don't have access to a Torchlight Child account, as offered in your employer's benefits package, but you'd like to, you can have your employer call us. They can find our information on our website, which is torchlight.care. That's www.torch l-i-g-h-t dot c-a-r-e Take care for now and see you next time. Thanks for listening to Torchlight's Exceptional Parenting Podcast. Find this and other episodes on iTunes, Spreaker, and Podcast Go. If you're interested in bringing Torchlight Child or any of Torchlight's other caregiving products to your workplace, please contact info at torchlight.care. That's info at T-O-R-C-H-L-I-G-H-T dot C-A-R-E.